Okay, I have one more question for you. Who has seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Yeah, almost everybody, yeah. It's a popular movie. They even wrote a book. Oh, yeah. I won't spoil anything. Um, Henk, can you show the slides here? Yes. I'd like you to meet Gandalf. Gandalf is a large language model. And he has been given a task. He knows a password and he should not reveal it. And in this game by Lake Era AI, your job is to design a prompt that will make Gandalf reveal his password. It's an interesting example of how what the language models can do, but also how they can be uh, broken or manipulated or used against the original intentions. Uh, it's also a very huge technical challenge to host these large language models. So, in fact, if you try to guess Gandalf's password too many times, you will run into rate limit errors from the open AI APIs that this system is built on. But I thought it's a very, very timely example of the topics we're discussing today because it's a black box. You don't know how it's built. It's supposed to have a password, but you don't know how to get it out. And how it has been built is also a very nice example of engineering of lang with language models. And, and then the deployment question relates to the practicalities. How do you make language models, especially large language models or, or any large AI system available to the public? So try it out. If you can pass the game, it gets harder each time you guess the password. So yeah, I like to show this slide every time from Ville Tulos book, Effective Data Science Infrastructure. It's here on the right, you see how much infrastructure uh, each layer of the data science stack requires. And on the other side, you see how much the data scientist cares about this. So I think in the, in the view of language models, this is very interesting because they are very hard to train and very hard to serve. So these problems are even bigger than with traditional data projects. I'll leave it at that. I'd like to welcome now Harri Ketamo on stage. He is the founder and chairman of Head AI. Yeah. You can you can sit if you like. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. I got instructions to avoid being in front of the microphone, so I tried to do something like this. Loudspeaker. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah, uh, I hope my slides are visible also in the online site. But I start. Uh, I'm founder of Head AI, and Head AI is a company established in 2015. We are building our own language technology, which applies quite large language models, which are completely different to the currently known GPT type of large language models. But a common thing for all the language models are related to transparency, explainability, and why something is there. And I'm walking quite generic stuff through today via our technology. But I would claim that everything 
we are discussing applies also GPT type of language model. But yeah, basically, what we do. My background is in computational sciences and cognitive sciences. And then bringing together two very different disciplines goes via physics, chaos theory. Because one, one approach for my research was in the very beginning that we can compute language with the rules familiar from chaos theory. So chaos theory is a loose set of different kind of mechanisms. But anyway, chaos theory, language, the same. And uh, we are applying shallow networks, but really wide. So the vector sizes can be huge, but the network size itself is shallow. So that's another difference. We are using CPU cores, not GPUs. Big difference, but because I know that there are developers here and you are going to ask everything, I tell it in advance so you understand why this is different. But another big difference is that our machine or algorithms, they are pre-trained like GPT, but they are trying to figure out from the text that what is the context? What are the key words? And now I don't mean single character strings starting from space, ending to space, but I mean what, what are the words like nuclear power plant security? This is one meaningful set of words. And it's very different to find single word compared to this kind of compound words or phrases or meanings. But yeah, our, our AI is trained to find out this kind of meaningful words out of any text. Let's say that we have A4 about something. It finds out the meaningful words, and the meaningful words explains the context, what the text is about. And with those meaningful words, context, it can bring in the words that belongs to the paper, but are not mentioned there. Like if, if it is about nuclear power plant security systems, and it is missing completely the uh, workforce or, or construction yard security, something safety, they will be there. And in, in cognitive sciences, we call this building a mind map or drawing a mind map. How many of you have been drawing a mind map ever? I bet all of you have. So, so you know that it, everyone, even six years old, can draw a mind map. But it's cognitively very challenging because you really, you have to recognize the context, what you are drawing about. You have to either know or read the core topics. And then you must be able to build the connections between the topics part of the context. So the connectors are super important. And then you are a have ability to bring new words in based on your previous understanding. Six years old can draw really cool mind maps about football or ice hockey. Professionals can draw mind maps about anything. But yeah, that's, that's what our machine do. And, and how we apply them. This is, this is now, now I'm walking through one example about skills need, skills demand. And here, our AI has drawn a map about language models skills demand this year. And these all are, these all words are found from job ads from EU area. And what more, what bigger demand that more in the center, the word is, that darker the color. Let's just zoom a little bit out. So, so in the center, there are the most strongest words. And in the outer rim, there are not that strong, but because this is a compression of EU skills demand, also the outer rim is really important skill. And this is now a mind map about approximately 10,000 job ads, and then summarized as a hexagon map. We can call it also strategy game board or tactical map in defense side. But anyway, this is hexagons. All the neighbors are connected to each other and starting from the center and six strongest connected to yeah, everyone I mentioned that. This enables, like, like we have language models here, this enables us to highlight that connections because six strongest can find a neighbor. But now you can see that, for example, uh, 
linguistics. Full neighborhood is those topics now not hidden. This is part of, let's say, transparency. We know that this is a clusterized map. Six strongest are connected. But the truth is that every concept or every topic, every skill, to have more connectors than just six. And here you can see the connectors. Large language models and language models seems to be related to everything is summary map. But this is not the full truth. This is already squeezed. The total skills demand, what comes around language models, uh, consists about 2,000 different skills. These are just the skills most strongest and directly to language models. So altogether, 2,000 skills. And now when you think that in, in, in Ilta Sanomat or any yellow press, they say that next autumn you need this skill in order to be qualified. What's out of this 200 or what's out of this 2,000 in real life? So when, when, when next, next July, Ilta Sanomat or Yellow Press says that don't come to work if you don't know how to deal with language models. So what? 2,000 skills. Okay, that was, that was part of it. But this, this is how we map things. In the next page, I have, with the same granularity, a fictive CV about game developer. How many of you have done games? So any game developers here? What do you think about profile? Is this a bit, bit, bit senior game developer if, if there is data science skills and graphical skills and all together? I think that this is a, let's say, pretty advanced game developer. But anyway, game developer CV based on the projects a fictive person has done. So blog post descriptions, what, we, what, what, what he or she has done, but CV as a knowledge graph. And when we put these two together, we are comparing that if this fictive game developer would like to change her or his career to language models, what skills she or he already have, they are in red. Yeah. And what is missing is in blue. And now this, this comparing it's really easy way to make visible that, OK, we have two different data sets. Skills demand in, in CVs from job ads related to large language models. Really huge data, but we can build a model that we can backtrack. We have a CV, couple of blog posts, couple of articles, couple of uh, maybe from portfolio, couple of texts, and then a synthetic CV about game developer, and we can compare that. Okay, you have already read, you only need blue skills. All right, this is, this is interesting. But if we want to go that in, in what jobs, for example, I might need, why, why there are these skills? In what jobs I need this? Part of transparency is that I can, I can backtrack that why, why something is there. We can take a look at why. Natural language is here. I'm not old, but I just have to look a bit close. And, uh, and this, is, this is another part of transparency. Why something is there? Why, why this concept? Why this relation? And it's also part of, pa part of the trustworthy of something. I, I, I bet that most of you have tried to cheat GPT because it's fun. But it doesn't make GPT bad. It is really great because you can design games like guys mentioned on top of the GPT. Nobody cares if, if it hallucinates every now and then. Every AI hallucinates every now and then, even ours. If we find something, I will show. But every, every AI hallucinates. But how this is related to similar type of or similarity with GPT type of language models and maybe a bit older, old school physics based language models. These are also predictions about the next. Even though we don't use the model to predict the next word, the neighbors are pretty much the next. If we would read that uh, as a story, 
we can find out paths like I think in this map it's not that relevant but let's take this this is now skills demand if we are reading from out uh, outer rim something we, we can find always the neighbors and even though we are now missing all the adjectives verbs pre and post positions we have just basically uh, object and subject we can we can read the story that this skill is related to computing which is related to Kubernetes, which is related to technologies and so on so so the similar phenomena can be found and it, nevertheless this can't produce text we can produce we, we can predict what is the most probable next skill the person would need and that helps in education when we come back to your skills demand now this this ability to predict the next or or the theoretical uh, probability that the next one is something helps us that if we, if, if we have this computer science the neighbors are something what I should study next because I know already the neighbors in cognitive sciences it's called called zone of proximal development so the area where you are able to learn on your best performance because you already know the basics or or you know something and you just go beyond your limits and this helps you or anyone who is changing the job to figure out that okay these are the skills I'm going to get because I already know something because they are neighbors and exactly the same GPT language model could be used exactly same purposes like tell me what is the most demand skills in large language models you can try it there comes pretty good tips but one challenge is that you have to really then use Google and check that okay which of these really are facts and which are just there I tested it all all is good but but you can't just trust language models without transparency and coming back to the original top, uh, idea about transparency that's why it's important large language models gives out very good average like this but if you can't deep dive you don't know why and if you don't have enough let's say general literature general understanding over the topic it's very difficult to define when something is fact and when it is just because it's the most uh, approximate word in the model and that's that's the that, that's the important part because what more we start to use language models and I strongly think that that's good thing let's go for it but at the same time we have to keep in mind that the critical thinking and literacy are the king skills for persons but in order to go a bit further once again how we can apply language models this is now a bit bigger this is not that much squeezed skills demand about language models in 23 so this year colors are now different because this is different visualization now when we have language model that can normalize the text in in a way that we can we can build some similar granularity between 23 20 i'm sharing the screen so you don't see that there are years at the bottom but different years we can start to do timeline analysis like 22 22 the skills demand is something like this every cell is an important skill 21 only few this is really interesting so language models 21 only this number of concepts while in 22 and 23 quite good number but surprise 20 empty and this is not bug it was really empty I checked that so 20 no skills demand around language models in 20 we called it natural language processing or or language technology but it, but the same neighborhood is there but not as a language models so NLP or, or linguistics but when we put this in timeline we can build this kind of timeline maps where we can see that all the blue skills blue demand is either emerging so appearing in this year or increasing 
while the orange ones and the red ones are something that are downtrending or disappearing altogether. And this is also one part of transparency. Can we backtrack the history? Why something is mentioned? Because one challenge with language model is that if we train them with the full history of mankind, we will get out full history of mankind. And we don't know which one are new, which one are old. But of course, in, in, in all, all the big language models, they are trained in a way that they are using, let's say, the newest one, even though knowing the history. So I would say there are many mechanisms to avoid this. But if, 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 if you are training your own model and you put the history of mankind there and you don't make any difference between 2001 and then 23, you will get different answers. But this is part of transparency, being able to track what's new, what's old, how they are related, uptrending, downtrending. Nothing new, but still important. And if we now once again dive in, here we have the large language models. There are skills that are downtrending. And I'm, I'm, I'm somehow interested that why skills like space engineer or compute, well, computer games might be obvious, like, like we just see an example of a game. But space engineer, large language models, highly interesting. Then we just have to once again deep dive, take the deep dive space engineer. And now this is bug. <laughs> but we go further. All right. Hey, last thing. If you get interested in checking and deep diving language models as, as this type of hexa maps and deep diving them. With, with pointing that why something is there or comparing different language models. We have just last week opened our premium platform. You, you just need to log in platform.headai.com. We don't sell your information. We sell our products. So feel free to do the login. And you can do testing like, like I had. Uh, there are different use cases like future proofing yourself, comparing your strategy or, or uh, future-proofing curriculum. I don't know if there are people from university, but if you're teaching something, test that. But I'm, I'm now future-proofing myself. And here we have this, uh, here we have, for example, this synthetic game developer, but we have also synthetic marketing specialist. We can take a labor market, so, so here's the graph. Or, or the mind map. We can take uh, marketing investments in health tech. We can do the compare. And when it is done, you can go and get recommendations for your learning. Because now in the language model point of view, we have the gap. And if we have other data sets in our model, like we have LinkedIn Learning and many universities, we can, we can ask that, give me courses from Metropolia. And now I get recommendations that, what courses can I take from Metropolia in order to learn the skills which are in my gap next to things I already know. And this is one use of, once again, how we can apply language models and the transparency thing. You know why you get recommended something because you need the skill, and you need the skill because it's in a certain jobs and you are missing it in your profile. This type of thinking, I, I would claim, is applicable to any, any language model use. If you use it for serious purposes, why something is there? Can you somehow help your solution to show why it is there? Because you can dig it out from the language model if you just find a way. Like in the game, you can, you can make GPT to reveal the password. But you have to think how to do it. If you are doing entertainment, then just do it storytelling. But this was pretty much what I'm talking about. Log into platform.headai.com, test it yourself. And uh, I think now we have time for questions. Yeah, we have. We do have time for questions.
who wants to go first? Maybe I get. Yeah, then, then you have a chance. Yes. Um, it's a very, very interesting question, this tracing back to the origins of the data. Uh, what do you think about uh, current popular language models? Is it even possible or feasible to build this kind of capabilities into them? I, I think uh, the GPT-3 language model is, is somehow, it has been polished that much that I would claim that it's very difficult because it has been polished very much topics like, like uh, war or genocide related topics has been just removed without thinking that how it, it affects. We don't know what materials has been fully removed. So it's difficult to fully backtrack. But I would claim that there are, there are tricks to find out the neighborhoods, the, let's say, clusters of words that might explain that why something is there. But I'm, I'm more interested what is really missing. And that's the big thing. Because for example, let's continue with labor market data because everybody knows it. It's easy. You are everyone professional in that. So, so in job ads, we can easily say that we are missing all the mani uh, top management C-level jobs. We are missing all the jobs that are inside the career ladders inside the company and so on. But we don't know what we are losing on super big language models generated from almost everything ever put into the web and then polished with some mechanisms. But yeah, I, I think it's important, but it's, it's not impossible, but difficult. Model four, is somehow, this is my thumb idea, it's designed in, in a better way. It has not been polished that, that let's say, random is a wrong word, but, but it, it's not polished in, in such way as, as three, so it's easier to backtrack. And I, I think four behaves much better. I'm, I'm somehow a bit worried about number five, because one, one of my concerns is that if, if the competition is about the corpus size, and four already applies everything applicable except uh, Trump, Twitter feed, and so on. But if, if we add all those, the, all, all those, maybe a bit questionable Twitter feed, social media channels, and all the stuff people has put during the last six months into, into Twitter and LinkedIn and blog posts that are truly written by number three and four, we are generating a language model that repeats itself and might have more bubbles. Yeah, I, I, know, I know that OpenAI knows it and, and Google knows it. But this is a big philosophical concern that if, if we are running a competition where the language model corpus size is the thing, and we have already used all the people produce corpus size, who is producing the next material? So that's, that's the question. And that's why the question is not in, in a professional applications that who has the biggest corpus. It's who has the best language model. And in fact, I claim it can be a small language model in the future. But knowing the limitations and being backtrackable. And yeah, in that sense, doable but difficult. But there are other concerns, but not, not only the tracking back something. Yeah. And now questions. <laughs> yeah. Here's one. Let me check the microphone. It works. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was interesting. I have a small question. What is uh, what would be the difference between uh, this uh, solution with uh, AI and uh, chaos theory and uh, some possible uh, simplified solution with uh, uh, pure parsing uh, CVs or open positions and then put it to some storage like SQL driven and uh, try to use uh, these simple um, tools. Uh, what do you think? What, what, what would be the difference in the result of, of it? Uh, it? It will be the, I, I would say, the output model quality. Of course, you can, you can parse everything, put it in SQL and ask uh, this kind of word cloud tool to build a word cloud. 
But word cloud don't understand meanings. It is checking the words. Like, like example, nuclear power plant safety procedures. It finds four words, nuclear, power plant, safety, and procedures. While a mechanism that is detecting that does some set of words establish a meaning finds nuclear power plant safety procedures, which is a meaning. So, so in that sense, you, you will get just a set of words without context if you use the tools, but you will get pretty similar stuff, but, but not, not, not in the same meaning. And when we are going to really understand that what is behind, for example, job ads in energy, if there are just words like, like green, steel, solar, power, voltage, it doesn't mean too much, but, but of, of course, when they are put together, there are good topics. But yeah, okay. good so, question. You get something, but, 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 but not, not the same as from the language model, no matter if it is our or GPT, but, but anyway, that's the difference. Thank you for the presentation. I have a like a maybe a bit of a follow up. I'm not sure what is the question there, but like a bit of a discussion on the topic of uh, like when the models are teaching them basically themselves at some point already. And how do we put in the scientific knowledge in there if it's all behind the paywall of some Elsevier journal or whatnot? While now a part of those models are also also produced including chat GPT as an author and so on. And how do we deal with that? How do we distinguish what of those are like? Yeah, that's, that's super important. And in, in fact, there is no black and white answer in that. The, the, the scientific papers, yeah, quite many are behind the paywall. Then quite many applies the scientific paper behind the paywall because the end result doesn't reveal papers. And it, it's, it's in, in fact, this is not a legal advice. This is just a mathematician's mathematician's opinion, so highlighting not the legal advice. But I, I think the language model is a new entity. And in that sense, you can use any data as a researcher because you are drawing a new entity. Legally, this might be different because some countries has forbidden using some materials, especially personal data behind the models. And there, I think that that's a fair thing. Because if you have in your personal health data, for example, rare health issues. They are in the model and you might be recognizable. So the identity must be there, which is in, in Europe, identity is always GDPR thing, no matter if it, if it is your sec social security number or a combination of three health issues that re reveals you. And in that sense, this is, this is not an easy topic because I think applying papers when you don't reveal the paper, but you build a model, it's okay. And in, in, in fact, we don't use at this point anything behind the paywall, but we are using materials and always referencing back. And I, I think this is pretty much the same as in science. If I'm referencing a paper and I point out what's the paper, where you can find it, and maybe given even a web link, that's scientific ref, uh, referencing. And that should be okay for models as well. But that is, that is something that is not that straightforward. So, so there are, like, like behind paywall papers are very different than your health record. So, so that, that's why there can't be black and white solutions. But uh, the question is really important that what we can put in the models, how we know what's inside the models. Is the model based on, uh, Elsevier paywall portal or just a Twitter feed about fake science. So it's really important. I, I don't have an answer, but guess the question is good. Someone else? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I have a very simple question uh harry uh we have a quite quite good nowadays machine which can solve a uh, very complex problem very easily with the with available computing power uh but and of course but uh, the problem is the, the bigger the model we have we have a currency problem so in your opinion in the future is the future is 
is the large language model or the future is, is about small model problem, specific problem and giving you more accurate results. Yeah, yeah I, thank you. And I, I have to say that, yeah, this was not paid even though he, he's my colleague and good friend, Hussein. But yeah. <laughs> I'm just learning. <laughs> yeah. So Hussein is also working in head AI, so you can ask from him as well afterwards when we are having coffee and pizza. But anyway, yeah, the future. There, there will be room for all the solutions. We need definitely large language models for many purposes. And especially we need them for entertaining purposes. We are just in the beginning of the entertain part. But then we also need small, specific, highly curated language models on, on very specific topics. To the uh, topics where we can't use GPT type of large language models. Yeah, uh, one, one very interesting research. I don't remember who has done it, and it was not in Finland. But it was studied that how people felt when they were in chat doctor. And they were randomly given real medical doctor's advices and chat GPT advices. And people preferred chat GPT because the real person was way too often rude. They were asked that why they prefer something or why they didn't like it. Real doctor was rude. The answer was maybe you shouldn't eat sugar and fat. Ah, wrong answer. So, so when, when ChatGPT has a good empathy, because the language model really gets good empathy if asked. And no matter what bullshit comes out, it's better. You must drink silver water, my child, to get cured. So, so, so that's, that's challenging, that if, if we think that large language models can solve everything, there are areas where we can't do it. But the responsibility is on our side, we developers. We have to be skillful enough to figure out when we can use large language models, when we should use smaller model, or when we just should use old-fashioned principal component analysis or something like that. Old statistics has not died, that's my claim. Old school stuff is still very relevant on, on certain purposes. Even the decision tree type of AIs outperforms machine learning in many cases where you can, from scientific basis, do the decision tree in very accurate way. And what's good in decision tree? It's transparent. So in that sense, to answer the question, too often we focus on that there is one thing that is given by God and will save us. But we don't think that we have a full history of science, at least 3,000 years if we start from Socrates or something. And, and 3,000 years, and we think that last three years only matters. And that's the biggest bubble we have. So I, once again, critical thinking, general literacy. And yeah, large language models are cool, but not everything. Thank you, Harsh. All right. Thank you. All right. We have now Shreya Rashpal online. So very happy to welcome her, her on stage virtually. Uh, she is the creator of Guardrails AI, which is an open source Python package. And um, you will soon learn what it does and why it's needed. Good morning, Shreya. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My, my pleasure. I think it's very early for you, but. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to chat about guardrails. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to, happy to get started. Uh, so I'm just going to test out sharing my screen here. Uh, sweet. Can I get a can I get a, a confirmation that um, you can see my screen? Yeah, we see. It. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, hey everyone. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Ah, uh, sorry. My bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey everyone. I'm I'm uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Shreya. I am the creator of Guardrails AI, which is uh, which, as Miko mentioned, uh, is an open source package to uh, add some idea of guardrails and constraints around uh, practical large language model development. Um, so uh, over the purpose of this talk, I'm basically going to go into like 
why we need guardrails and also what guardrails practically mean, um, you know, in the context of building applications that use large language models. And uh, there's this uh, abstract idea of guardrails that all of us tend to agree on, but uh, uh, very tactically, it's unclear, you know, like what does a guardrail for my specific use case mean versus, you know, for uh, versus the general idea of guardrails. And so my goal for this talk is to, you know, de uh, demystify some of that and uh, and put it into consideration about like if, if all of you are building applications, you know, how you can like make sure that those applications are a little bit more reliable and a little bit more aligned with uh, with your end goals of what you want to use that application for. Um, so with that, uh, I'll get started into the talk. Um, all right. So uh, what's missing from the AI stack today? Um, so this uh, L LMs are absolutely amazing. Like the whole conference is a testament to that fact about like how excited, uh, you know, uh, all of us globally are about large language models. Uh, but as awesome as they are, they're still brittle. Um, so there's a lot of app issues uh, that come up during large language model development. Uh, for example, the most common issue that people tend to see is that um, um, a large language model works while prototyping, but you know is flaky while running uh, th the same prototype in production. Um, uh, another kind of difficult thing about working with large language models is that getting correct outputs uh, from a large language model is al always hard. And of course, correct means different things for different people uh, in different contexts, etc. But whatever your definition of correct is, uh, getting getting that getting that correctness always to be guaranteed is a hard task because at the core of a large language model is this stochastic system that you know is hard to um, is hard to have guarantees over. Um, so some common issues that typically pop up are around hallucinations. Uh, so this is when the large language model you know there's like falsehoods or there's imagined facts uh, in the prediction that it generates. Uh, there's you know no correct structure. So let's say you want the LLM to make some decision for you about what is the next action to take uh, using a large language model, but it uh, completely you know ignores that and maybe j just generates text that you know doesn't adhere to that decision at all but just you know um, uh, is just uh, random text that is not usable um, uh, the other interesting thing about working with large language models is that the only tool uh, that is available to a developer is prompt um, so typically if you're working as an engineer and you're using like any um, uh, any system, you know, as a software abstraction, you would typically be able to, you know, like um, add some custom code, add basically some behavior uh, of conditionals, etc. If this happens, then do that. If if you know this other thing happens, then then take this other action, etc. To make sure that there's, you know, some guarantees to make sure that your code executes as you uh, uh, as you expect it to, and that you have a high coverage over all possible things that could happen. Uh, but in the case of a large language model, the only tool um, that the developer can really use to control the LLM is the prompt, um, which is ordinarily, you know, just a string of English text, and that seems woefully insufficient. Um, so all of this means that the application of LLMs in production systems um, is restricted because of these problems. What can we? Um, what can we do in general to, you know, like avoid this? So uh, in general, the idea is that. Um, LLMs are, you know, a powerful stochastic system uh, that um, are able to handle a wide variety of tasks. Uh, but the moment you try using that powerful stochastic system uh, in something like a more brittle deterministic system, which is typically, you know, like if you have to take that and like maybe connect it to your databases or maybe connect it to other uh, tasks downstream of a large language model, uh, that interface between the stochastic system um, and the deterministic system often tends to be very brittle because of the unreliability of LLMs at production scales. So this is where um, this is where guardrails comes in. Um, so guardrails, oops, my bad. Um, guardrails makes the interface, you know, um, between these two systems um, more deterministic. So uh, essentially what guardrails does is it makes it so that as a developer, uh, you are able to think about, you know, from the ground up, like what are the correctness criteria you really care about? And guardrails makes it so that you combine uh, a large language model, you know, with other systems like rule-based heuristics or with more traditional machine learning systems, et cetera, to ensure that uh, that interface between these two systems, you know, becomes like more, more robust, essentially. 
So um, how does Guardrails uh, really do this? So Guardrails is an open source package to add uh, structure, type, and quality guarantees uh, to large language model outputs. So uh, it essentially enforces structure and type guarantees. So an example of this is you know, um, generating JSON. So if you want your large language model to generate JSON, or generate some structured data that feeds into something like an Excel spreadsheet downstream, or you know, or, or essentially any data that needs to have some structure on it. Guardrails can help you generate that structured data. Um, in addition to that, Guardrails does a pydantic style validation of LLM outputs uh, for semantic correctness. So uh, for people who are in the in the audience who are not familiar with pydantic, essentially all Guardrails does is it adds small verifiable programs to the large language model output that essentially are able to check if you know some semantic correctness criteria is met from the um, um, uh, from the output of the LLM. So this could be something like make sure there's no profanity in the generated text, or make sure that there's no personally identifying information that is revealed uh, in the generated text. Um, so all of these um, all of these criteria turn into you know like small programs that are executed on the output of the LLM uh, to essentially ensure that these uh, uh, these criteria are met. Um, the third thing that Guardrails does is that if there are any failures either on structure and type uh, or on you know the small um, basically on the uh, pedantic style validations of the LLM outputs, Guardrails takes corrective actions, um, including you know maybe refraining from answering uh, if that quality criteria is not met, or even in cases where you can ask the large language model itself uh, to correct its output given sufficient context. Um, so Guardrails essentially under the hood manages all of this for you, um, you know by uh, by constructing prompts and by checking those programs to essentially make sure that you have an output that you know fits your fits your criteria. Um, so how it works in practice. So um, the the image on the right might uh, you know, essentially be a little bit smaller, but the goal is not for you uh, as in the audience to, you know, actually read the image. It's, you know, just to for me to walk you through the workflow. So if some of that text is illegible, uh, you're not missing out on any key details. So um, yeah, so don't worry about it. Um, but how guardrails works under the hood is that there's this idea of a rail specification. So rail stands for a reliable AI markup language. Um, and how Rail essentially works is that um, you, um, as a developer from the bottom up, uh, you think about, you know, what is the criteria that I want my large language model to adhere to? Um, and this essentially ends up looking like, okay, if I have an output, um, my output should, you know, contain like two fields. Um, let's say, you know, a string that refers to some explanation of a text that I'm generating and, you know, a URL that, that like, um, uh, make sure that, you know, that, um, a, a URL that is valid and that is actually reachable and live uh, that is generated. Uh, some other criteria is that maybe I want to use this generated text in a tweet. Uh, so I want to make sure that you know any text that is generated has length less than 280 characters. Uh, so this then becomes you know like quality criteria that you can then specify in your real spec. Um, so essentially, you start by thinking top down of like for a specific application, what does correctness mean to me, and then convert convert that into a specification framework using rail. Um, you also contain like other things uh, like basically, so output structure we discussed, but um, other things like what are the quality guarantees that I want this output structure to adhere to? So in this case, it was, you know, like the URL should be valid and reachable. The length of my tweet should be, you know, less than some characters, but these can be arbitrarily complex. So it can have things like if there's text, make sure that there, the text is, has no biases for um, you know uh, for for a specific audience that I want to target, or if I'm generating you know like code, make sure that make sure that that code is actually verifiable, actually executable, etc. For my use case. Um, other things that you can specify in Rail is your affordance for failure of a task. Um, so once again, because LLMs are stochastic, failures are, are not a question of if, but a question of when. You know, uh, so. 
sorry. So when that when that validation failure happens, um, what is the affordance for that failure? Is this something where you know uh, is it sufficient as a developer and as a user to just know that a validation failure happens? In which case, you know, you can just basically say, hey, if something is invalid. Uh, if the LLM does not behave how I expect it to, just you know, like log it somewhere. Don't actually take any action. Um, other cases are when you have very, very low affordance for incorrectness. Maybe let's say that there is some. Um, if you're generating code, as an example, and that code is invalid, then that code is not really useful to you uh, if it's not executable. You know, so then in that case, you have very low affordance for an LLM outcome. Um, and so you can set uh, in case there's a validation failure, you can ask the large language model to re-ask uh, to correct itself to like essentially self-heal uh, the code that it's generated in case that in, uh, you know um, uh, so, so as to get a more correct output and both of these are things that you can specify uh, in the real specification um, finally, I think a, a small note here is that you can set dynamic inputs here. So Rail is a markup language, but you can in inject code snippets in it uh, to essentially make sure that you know your um, uh, you can extend the language for a lot of use cases. Um, so you start out by creating this Rail specification, which really for the developer is an exercise in thinking bottoms up about you know what the lot what the correct uh, LM output looks like. Um, you also contain information about prompts uh, and chat instructions, etc. Uh, and then what guardrails does under the hood is it takes that rail specification um, and wraps it in a guard class. Um, and the guard class essentially does a few different things for you. So first off, the rail specification takes you know information about the output structure and schema and updates the gener updates the prompt that you want to use in with your large language model with that information. Uh, so there's you know like essentially uh, some boilerplate that guardrails adds along with some relevant context about output structure etc that you know um tends to get you the right output structure from gpt3 just to start out with um so um this is one of the few things where you know if you if you prompt the llm correctly you know uh, there that is like um uh, that like takes you very far uh, and then you know you can essentially like you have to do like maybe f lesser re-asking lesser correction because your outputs will tend to be more correct than you know than than before um so uh, once you essentially take that prompt, uh, you send it to the LLM, and you end up getting some output back. Uh, so the output that you get back will be like some string. Uh, and what Rail, Guardrails does for you under the hood is it takes that string and all of the validation criteria that you specified in your Rail specification, all of those are converted into you know like independent verifiable programs that are then the output of the LLM is checked against those programs. So if in for like carrying on with our simple example of generating a tweet, is it that is this output text actually less than you know 280 characters? Um, or uh, there's another thing that we do where we actually try visiting the URL that is generated uh, and you know making sure that that is a live URL that can be reached. Um, so all of the validation is done using the rail spec to see what is met and what is not met. In case validation does not pass, uh, what Guardrails does for you is it constructs a new prompt with all of the relevant information about why validation was, uh, you know, failed. So, for example, uh, in the case of the tweet, it'll, you know, Guardrails will construct something like this tweet is too long and therefore it's unusable to me. Please recreate a new tweet, you know, that that works for me under the hood. Um, and so th this new prompt will be created that then is forwarded to the LLM, etc. Um, and you know, like revalidated. So all of this can be configured. Um, and in case validation passes, the corrected validated output is you know like forwarded to the end user um, to use in their application. Um, cool. So that was a high level overview of the process. I think now I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about how to create real specifications. Uh, and what this really is, is, you know, an exercise in like thinking, uh, thinking from the ground up in like how to work with large language models. So um, let's say our task here to is to extract structured data uh, from doctor's notes. 
And so here's some example doctor's notes that uh, I'm not going to read it out loud, but you know, typically this has like some shorthand uh, and some, you know, basically scribbles, et cetera, when a patient like first visits a doctor's clinic. Uh, and then the information that we want to extract from the doctor's notes are basically the patient's gender, um, the patient's age, um, a list of symptoms where each symptom has, you know, a severity rate rating about like how severe the symptom is, as well as an affected area. Um, and a list of medications, you know, that um, that basically say, like, what are the medications that this patient is on and how has the response to that medication been? Um, for the purposes of, I am just going to add like some more context here, which is like for the purposes of this example, let's say that the doctor, you know, is like a um, is like an ENT specialist. And so the affected area for a symptom can only be, you know, like head, neck or chest. Um, right. So it can't be if you have, let's say, a problem with your legs. So maybe this is not the right doctor to visit it. And so affected area for symptoms has to be constrained within that limit. So how you um, how you essentially work from that is that you uh, all of that information that you wish to extract is converted into a real spec where you can essentially have like some markup that looks like, you know, everything. So let's say here's, you know, the gender that I want to extract and a description of the gender. Um, age for a patient that I want to extract, a list of symptoms where you specify that each symptom actually uh, is a dictionary where, you know, um, I have the symptom and I have the affected area. And I can also add relevant context for each symptom here, uh, for, for each information that I want to extract. Um, other things like current medication are also specified as a list of objects. Um, and then given this specification, um, you essentially uh, specify like what the desired quality criteria are. So in our case, the desired quality criteria is that, you know, affected area should be one of head, neck or chest. Um, and um, um, we basically like because we want to enforce this quality criteria, we essentially add a validator, um, you know, called valid choices to our existing real specification that says that, OK, valid choices for a value are between, you know, these three things that we want. Um, other uh, corrective actions are that, like, if you want, this is this is where you specify your affordance. So you say that um, if the LLM does not uh, generate a valid output, that I wanted to self-correct. Uh, and so the if valid choices validator fails, I wanted to basically re-ask until it gets the right outputs. So uh, this is like one of the options that is provided to the LLM. So re-ask uh, is, is one of the options. But uh, there's, you know, a, a ton of other ways to handle incorrect outputs, such as, you know, filtering any incorrect outputs or, you know, refraining from asking or maybe just like going back to the user and asking for more relevant context until you can correct yourself. Uh, until you know the, you can generate like correct out, uh, outcomes. Um, so we add like for the quality criteria, we add like these two uh, you know lines in the in the schema that we previously constructed. So in the relevant field of the schema, we essentially add like format should be um, sorry. Format should be valid choices, head, neck, or chest, uh, and then you know on fail valid choices re ask you know for the relevant field. Um, Cool. So once we specify the desired output schema, we basically say this is what my prompt looks like. Um, so I can essentially say, OK, um, this is, you know, some some meta level information about what the correct uh, what, what is the task we're trying to do for the LLM, et cetera. So this is, you know, any prompt that you would ordinarily use with some boilerplate from guardrails. Um, and then once we actually like do this, like the final output that we end up getting from the large language model kind of looks something like this. So this is what the first uh, call would basically, uh, you know, this is what the first call would essentially like return for you, where you have like patient information is, you know, the structured output of like gender is this, age is this. These are what, you know, my symptoms look like. This is the current medication that the patient is on. And then we can also check that, you know, each symptom, each affected area for each symptom is between like head and neck. So the interesting thing here is like that was, you know, guardrails uh, kind of like doing a few different things for you under the hood. And if you're working with guardrails, you end up getting this output kind of in a one shot manner. Uh, but but under the hood, you know, there's like some correction, et cetera, that happens. So 
for example, this is what the raw large language model output looks like for you when you start doing this. So essentially, the thing I want to draw your attention to is that affected area to start out with was not you know, uh, one of these. It was because it was directly taken from the text. It was essentially something like face and hair, uh, beard and eyebrows, et cetera, um, which you know don't fit into the classes or categories that we care about. And so when we re-ask the large language model with all of the relevant context, et cetera, we end up getting like this corrected area that you know guardrails generates. And this um, new schema is merged with like our old schema, which has all of this other information about gender, age, symptoms, et cetera, uh, to get this like combined validated output with you know the correct uh, the correct output. So this is what we kind of like looked at before. Um, cool. So uh, these are like all of the ways of handling invalid outputs that Guardrails, you know, kind of provides for you. So I've talked about re-asking, you know, that basically um, all is automatically handled for, for an application by Guardrails by, um, you know, auto-generating a prompt that is used to, you know, get correct results. Um, other options that you can do are like deterministically fixed. So in case validation fails, you can set it to a default value that you know to always be true. So this is the place to you know inject like maybe some rule-based heuristics, et cetera, uh, that you can add and you know essentially make sure that they're always met. Uh, you can like filter any incorrect value. So um, this is you know like in this case what would happen is that the rest of the output is passed through, uh, but just the just the field with the incorrect value is removed. Uh, so in this case, this this you know for us this would be like the affected area, while the patient's age, gender, etc., still continues to be returned to the user. Um, you can refrain from answering. So refrain is you know when the quality when the affordance is so low um, that you know you don't want to respond at all, and you want to say like actually this is outside the scope of what I as a large language model uh, or, 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 or I as an application can answer, and so you essentially return like none um, or some other default message here. Um, no op, which is to do nothing but just log that an incorrect output was generated. Um, so you can use this essentially for, you know, iterating on your prompt and updating your prompt, um, you know, uh, for experimentation. And then finally, exception. So this is, you know, like um, if if uh, my validation does fails, then just like raise an exception and, you know, like alert the developer, et cetera, that something untoward has happened. So this, you know, essentially as a developer, this gives you a lot of control um, to the output and to the user. Um, I see a Miko, you've raised your hand. So uh, I'm just going to like, I assume it's for a question. So I'll just like um, open it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. You have five minutes. OK, cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, then we have a few time for a few <laughs> questions after that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. Appreciate it. Um, um, cool. Uh, in addition to that, guardrails for you, you know, like stores all logs and outputs. So essentially, uh, every single LLM API call gets logged under the hood that you can access. So that contains information about, you know, uh, every request that you made to um, uh, to a large language model, including its prompt, uh, its response. Um, you know, the validation, like which validations pass, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, the corrective actions to take. So all of this is logged under the hood, um, which can be, you know, like stored to memory or written out to disk, et cetera, as well if needed. Um, what guardrails cannot help with. So if the large language model does not have the ability to do something, uh, guardrails will not give it that ability. Uh, you know, for example, like some large language model are uh, some large language models are bad at generating code or bad at generating structured outputs. So in that case, guardrails is not going to make it. You know, where an LLM becomes better at that, but it would like if the LLM has that capability, guardrails would make sure that you know, like um, if you're running an application that uses that ability at scale, uh, then your you know success rate like increases. Um, compared to just using the raw lar lar uh, large language model. So I had prepared a little demo. Um, I might not have as much time, so maybe I can do a quick speed run through it um, and take about a minute or so. Um, so the application that I wanted to show for using guardrails essentially was using text to SQL. 
uh, where uh, on a very high level, what this application does is that you want to ask questions over your data. Like, for example, tell me about my spending patterns or, you know, what was the biggest, um, what was the product that had the biggest sales price, you know, in um, some quarter or something. So any, any questions that you want to ask over, like maybe some database, uh, you can pass in a natural language query and, and GPT-3 generates, you know, a, a, a SQL query from that natural language query. Um, and what guardrails comes in and helps with is that it allows you to, you know, like make sure that the generated SQL is valid for the database that you want to use it in. And how guardrails, you know, does this under the hood is it um, uh, takes either some information about the schema uh, of your database or it, you know, contains information about like the connection string to connect to that database. And it creates like a sandbox replica of that database that it uses to, you know, validate any output query against. Uh, so what this is uh, allows us to do is like make sure that the query is like executable. And if it is not, you know, allows it to like correct itself. So I'm, I'm going to like do a quick walk through, uh, walk through this, but um, essentially we start out by loading some examples. So these are, you know, like um, guardrails text to SQL injects these examples into the prompt to make sure that, you know, you're trying to like uh, also giving it examples about what the most relevant um, or the most relevant you know future examples are which tends to improve model performance this is um, instantiating the text is equal application using guardrails and we see that we you know pass it this like schema file uh, and like a dummy connection string that the schema file is initiated in, and the examples that we want to use um, we do that and we essentially uh, I'm going to increase the font screen here but um, we um, Sorry, uh, we do that and we ask it the question like, what is the name of the department with the highest number of employees? Uh, and oh, sorry, my bad. Um, ah, um, sorry about that. I had set this up before, but I think we something happened. Um, but essentially, the idea is that like you can ask uh, the large language model applications about you know what the name of the department with the highest number of employees is, uh, and if this works as expected, you should you know kind of see an output uh, that basically shows the SQL query for getting this output. So this just ran live and it's the okay, so like some some information about you know select SQL query. Uh, so this is working as expected, but what happens you know when we try it on some output that is not expected. So for example, what if the SQL that was generated by the large language model looks something like this? Um, select name from departments ordered by something. But the key thing here is that departments is not a table that is actually present in that database. And so if we ran this application using guardrails and then print the corrected output, uh, we essentially see that the output was corrected with the right table name. Uh, and we can kind of look at like what happens under the hood and we can see that like on validation, we can see that this value is incorrect, you know, because of some reason and this incorrect value is taken and a new prompt is created with information about why this value is incorrect so that we end up getting, you know, the corrected output once we provided sufficient context. Uh, so these are, you know, like some, some the way of interacting with guardrails and you can build like similar applications for other use cases with other semantic correctness ideas. Um, cool, um, that is um, basically the, the presentation. Uh, you can like keep up with guardrails uh, using the GitHub repo. Um, here's a link uh, to the docs, et cetera. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Um, my Twitter basically is me shilling guardrails constantly at this point. So if you follow me on Twitter, you can keep up with updates about guardrails. And then we also have a Discord community. Um, so I'm going to keep it up at this page, but uh, thank you so much. I understand that we're out of time for questions, possibly, uh, Miko, if that's the case, but I'm happy to stick around in case that's, um, uh, in case that's helpful. Thanks a lot. Raya, we have time for a couple of quick questions. It would be a shame to skip those. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm here waving. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Great. Antti, can you yeah, put the mic? Hello. I hope you can hear me. Um, I was wondering about uh, uh, re-asking the large mm -hmm. language model. Um, maybe sort of like a more like a how how are the internal workings like? How does the guardrails produce or um, 
like yeah how does the how does Godrest produce like a new prompt and um i don't know can you tell more about how, how it composes that new, new prompt yeah yeah i think that's a great question so um i will um i will give a very high level answer for it and if it's helpful i can also maybe show you you know some of the code again so there's like some preset formats for um re-asking that i basically did a bunch of like prompt engineering on and that i know kind of to work well and so what guardrails really does like the real value of guardrails is it thinks about how best to format and how best to present any errors that happened in your previous output so that you know the next prompt is like more likely to correct itself or not um so i i hope you can see kind of my screen here but essentially the idea is that um let's say that you know after validation you understand that this SQL query is incorrect and this is the error message for why that SQL query is incorrect and you know maybe some other like high level metadata etc so what guardrails will do for you is it'll take all of this information and format and present the error message correctly so that you know you end up getting a response that looks more likely more more correct than not so in this example of text to sql uh, the new prompt that is generated you know still has information about like this is the schema of the table that is you know uh, necessary context in order for the llm to correct itself it still has some example of you know like uh, some some um, example of like what the generated output etc should look like but with that you essentially end up saying um so I'm trying to find it in this super long prompt. Yeah, within that, you essentially end up like saying to the LLM, you generated like previous output for me, which was like incorrect for this reason, uh, and essentially like correct itself, correct the output so that you know you end up getting something that's more correct, uh, so something that's like more valid. So um, essentially, the key is like constructing prompts and knowing like templates for prompts that tend to work well, and Guardrails kind of handles the you know like error surfacing etc for you correctly. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we have a lot of time, but maybe one more. Um, um relevant example maybe would be that this is my getting started guide so i'm not going to go through the guide exactly but here you can kind of see that there's a few yeah there's actually a few different validation failures so this is from the presentation but you can see that okay these affected area values are incorrect you know because they don't fit into like head neck or chest etc in that case you know like guardrails basically like only um constructs a prompt with the relevant fields that are incorrect and gives it some more boilerplate, et cetera, that is helpful for correcting itself. So all of this, this entire prompt is auto-generated um, based on what Guardrails does, and then you end up getting you know, the raw corrected like validated output. Hopefully that, hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. I had a quick question about, um, you said that uh, Guardrails you know, like get, generates like boilerplate to boilerplate so that it could get like better answers. Uh, I was wondering how, how much work there is then to like uh, make changes to this boilerplate gen generation for different uh, large language models. Ah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think like um, it's basically, I think the job is basically like prompt engineering in some cases. So. For my end users, like for guardrails end users, I don't expect them to, um, you know, need to have to do like an exploration over that boilerplate to just get working with guardrails. So in some sense, like my assumption while working with the library is that, okay, I will do that. Like guardrails and library kind of, you know, takes that burden on and it's my job to do that, um, to, to figure out what the best boilerplate for each model is. Um, that said, like all of this is completely configurable and I have had users where, you know, like you start figuring out what works well and you can even like make it less verbose, et cetera, so that you're using less tokens and, you know, configure it yourself so you can kind of do that. Um, so I guess the, the, it all kind of like comes down to prompt engineering, like either on my end or the user's end. Um, I think like for figuring out what works well that like, um, uh, all of this was, you know, built, uh, like prototyped using like OpenAI's GPT-3, 3.5 and 4. Uh, so for all of that, it took me about, you know, like um, a, a day or two's worth of effort to do like the prompt engineering and then, you know, like a lot of testing to make sure it works like across a ton of use cases. Um, um, and that's kind of like my prompt engineering, like um, velocity to some, some extent. Um, but if you have like, yeah, I, I think it's like, it would, I think, like vary from people to people. It would essentially be like kind of some experimentation, kind of across what works well or what doesn't. 
Yeah. Hopefully that was a, yeah, I think my, my, hopefully that was an, um, that, that answers your question. I think it was a little bit of, you know, it's like prompt engineering. So like however, however much time it takes for you to kind of figure out what works well for specific models. Yeah. 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 Related to this same topic, one of the great features that is that it's, uh, easy to version control this rail specs. So kind of gives you the full developer experience that is lacking from LLMs. Okay, thank you, Shreya. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah, thank you for inviting me again, Miko. Um, yeah, I had a really good time here. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, you can reach Shreya in Twitter and the Guardrails AI Discord. So be sure to check those out. We're ready to let Sergey on stage. So Sergey is the, one of the founders and also the chief operating officer of Veracell. And he will now tell us how the LLMs can be used in business problems. Thank you, Mikko. It seems that I'm on, right? So I will first briefly introduce myself and the company. It may sound like an advertisement, but we really need that for the context for the rest of the presentation. So we, we are a very small consultancy founded, based here in Tampere, started six, six years ago. Just checking that it works. Uh, so we, we basically develop all kinds of data-driven applications to data science exploration projects, cloud infrastructure, whatever that revolves around data and data science. And we have... Uh, just like mentions of a couple of things that we do. And lately also we have been doing projects that revolve around GPT-4 and other large language models, mostly in health domain. And uh, so we are about 20 people. We have 10 employees and we have lots of freelancers that are working, working on our projects. And we have like quite large skill gaps we have lots of PhD level people and we have lots of junior people who are maybe in their first workplace. They may, may be like second year students and they want to get into IT and be productive. Uh, and myself, I'm the CEO now since last year and I have background in signal processing, bioinformatics, cancer genomics from the from the university and about last four or five years, I switched from academia to doing IT, IT projects. And now to the subject itself, it's very different than the previous ones. I thought at first that maybe I would just give a run through of what kind of projects we have at leverage, for example, GPT-4. But I thought that that's something that you read from LinkedIn every day anyway. So instead, I'll, I will be talking about how GPT-4 is changing the whole mode of working, especially in, in consultancies, and how it transforms developers into strategic thinkers. So let's start like how GPT-4 basically allows anybody to become a true journalist. If you think about a small small consultancy, like what's, what's the first goal, first mission for it? And there's only one, it's to, it's to get bigger because if you don't grow, you basically don't have any reason to exist. It's just a hobby project at that point. And as a small company, you're thinking, you're, you, you, you have started it with a couple of friends, just nobody else will join like a small company just for fun because it's not really that fun even. And uh, you try to hire the first people at your company and you think like, okay, there's only like four of us and we need, need a fifth one. So you start thinking like we need, we need senior people who are, who are independent, who can contribute to the company, who can start new projects and work without help. But it's very risky and very difficult to get seniors on board. Uh, even if you offer them equity or something, most of them are just not really interested in after like already like toiling for 10, 15 years in IT, you go back to that small company where, where you don't have perks, you have long days, you have to like 
stretch and so on. Uh, and a couple of years ago, so what's the other option? Like, Tampere is full of enthusiastic and very talented juniors, but you're afraid to hire them. And a couple of years ago, it's like understandable. It took quite a lot of time to get them on board, to train them. It may take like weeks or months before they're really productive, and you can you can use them in customer projects without half of their time being actually your time helping them all the time. And now that we started actively using GPT-4 in our work, that's kind of the first and very important thing to us that I have noticed. Uh, so there's this one, one project that is going on, and from the get-go, it's basically me leading it, and there's two guys who are studying IT, but they've never worked in an IT company, never done any full-stack development project. And using GPT-4, you can basically on, onboard them really fast. They became instantly productive. They were happy with their work. They saw that they are actually contributing to something. So I see that this really this helped so much like to solve this recruitment problem, this like skill gap in your, in your team. And it's not only for junior developers, but also for senior ones, whatever developers. It's like quite simple examples, but they all examples that I have here are like real examples of stuff that I've used to either explore things or solve things. So uh, before even if you were like experienced developer, what, what seniority means, sometimes in the worst case, it just means you're old. And in some cases, it means that uh, you have used some library or framework for five years. So you know right away what components to use, like how to, how to plan something. But it's just not as valuable anymore because you can easily do stuff with GPT-4. I, I, I didn't have much experience in like front-end development. I just like knew on a high level, like what I want, how stuff works, what is programming, how can I like see like the logic of the code. And that was kind of enough. I didn't have to like take React courses and, and do like buttons and menus for three years and they call my, myself like senior developer. So that's like one thing. And going forward, so okay, if we think about that the entry level people, they can now do lots of coding much faster that they, or like start doing that much faster than they ever did before. So where does that leave the senior programmers? And I've seen, and when I'm saying I've seen, I don't mean like I read from LinkedIn, but that I'm actually driving the change and seeing it in our everyday work. For me, it's a blessing. For people who love coding, it may be a curse. But GPT-4 and like other LLM-based tools, they basically free like senior programmers from from coding, which is most of the time, most of the time, like any of you probably do also. It's like, it's, it's pretty simple. You do the same things that people have done a million times before, and they will do a million times again. And you don't need a PhD for that. And I really hope that people who have PhDs also don't want to do that like every day in their lives. So this is like really uh, reshaping the role of a technical lead or senior senior programmer or like data scientist, uh, you should not code anymore. And instead, you should use your experience, your, your knowledge, your degrees and understanding to managing the teams and projects, specifying and evaluating the outcomes. And if you think about the composition of the team and how many seniors or leads you need, how many juniors you need. It's going to change. I don't really see in many customer projects that any of them would require like a full-time lead or a senior programmer anymore. It's enough that you, for a day or two, you specify things, you plan things, you look after the results and help with the actual challenging problems, which are never coding. Because I've never seen, uh, uh, for example, in our projects that some project would like fail because people were not good enough coders. They were, they're always failing for other reasons. Uh, 
Uh, there's like just some very, very basic examples, but again, true life examples that you sometimes just have to do. Like you can think that you're doing like very important health stuff and you're like experienced developer, but sometimes you run into very simple tasks. But if you do them manually, it just takes like a couple of hours. I just like the first one, I just, I just tried because uh, it came back again in, in this one health project. And as uh, also in the previous presentation, previous presentations, we're talking about like sensitive data and masking and stuff. So very simple thing, just mask some stuff and text. And three years ago, I used maybe a day for doing that. I knew what I need to do. I kind of knew how it needs to be done. I knew how efficient it, it should be at, and, and what methods I can use to make it so. And now, three years after, the same exact same thing that I thought I started doing myself three years ago and used a day for that. And let's say if it's a, if it's a nice customer, it's like nice amount of money. And now with this one prompt, I got perfectly working code in like five or 10 minutes. So it, it really changes how you should think about, like as a senior, how you should, should think about work. We just think this one and throw it to somebody and say, please do it. And then somebody starts coding. You're wasting like everybody's time now. And you need to keep that in mind every day. Yeah, and I will be asking, People working every day. You should try it out with that, G that GPT. And this, sounds, this all sounds a bit aggressive towards seniors and leads and so on. But the good thing is, it's not like taking your jobs away, it's actually helping you in your job. And as I said, like uh, the coding skills. They're not usually the bottleneck in, in the projects and not the reason why projects fail or not the reason why like, like they fail because people do wrong stuff. It's not because they don't know how, they don't know how to do stuff. Because you, you don't know how to fail it. Then often you don't know how to sell it to yourself what needs to be done. And I think that GPT is also a perfect tool for this one. For example, if I have like entry level developers working with me, we think about the targets together. I can write some, write some tickets, just run them through the prompt. And I get like all the templates, I get the needed examples for the code and entry level developers. If I just give the ticket and you have never done that before, you will start Googling. Okay, so how can I, if, if you are shy, you will start Googling. How can I do this? How can I please my boss and do it myself? And if you are more extroverted, you will start asking seniors, so how, how should I approach this? Can you show me this and that? And then again, we're using a lot of time. So just like if GPT, like the, the ticket, and it can buy it for you, give templates, examples, and people can start working right away on what needs to be done. Uh, these are also, also real ones from a project like, because of life, uh, Life has become so efficient and fast. I make a lot of typos. So this Git bug, it's not a new service. It's actually GitHub. And also one thing that I haven't tried so actively, but basically explaining the technical stuff to people who are not very technical. It often doesn't come that easy to us because we know stuff like pretty well. So just tell, GPT, what you want to say, or just give the code. Tell who the audience is, what the situation is, and it just does it. So you don't need to use your brain for that. Save it for something else. And this is this one I, I really like because before it was like really easy to hide behind seniority and coding skills and and everything and. And say, for example, that, yeah, I will look into it. I'm researching it for like three days or something. Like researching what? So now, like if, if, we, if we talk about like skill sets of developers, like senior developers, leads, PhDs, so on, it's not a new thing. It's what people have said all the time on LinkedIn, for example, that Communication is the most important thing. You need to do like, you need to collect the requirements. You need to keep the focus on the targets. Like we all know that, but I'm pretty sure like 
many of us have seen projects. Somebody can be in that kind of organizations, but not really following that. We're just like saying that when we're having a, having a coffee break. And one, one, like, I think that one reason for that, it's like so difficult to measure the benefit or the like outcome of using time for planning beforehand. That's kind of the fallacy that we get. Like, I, I can just, I'm, I know what to do. I will start doing that. But in most of, most of the, like, most of the time, if you just start doing stuff, you don't, you don't really know what you're doing. So I have this one, not really game, but, uh, I like to like ask people to write a prompt if they're doing something and see like if you know what you're doing please write a prompt or, or like before that just write write a ticket or something and you will see like right away you, can, you, can, you will see like right away if they don't know how to do that somebody may be like not even able to start a sentence or like writing a prompt or they get something incorrect back and they can they see from that that now there's something wrong either where, either with specifications or with my understanding of what, what we're actually doing. And, and you just write longer stuff, more detailed stuff. Because when you get the responses, you will see what are the things that you didn't think through because GPT-4 is not thinking for you. And you don't even need to use the output in the end. You can use it just for like, throwing ideas back and forth and using that for, for completing your specifications and seeing like what, where are the, like the gaps in my, in my thinking. Um, and then we come to like the final, final issue, like the main issue in, in many, many projects and, and cases. So if you think like before it, you would be like a PO or, or like some kind of, upper lead and you're planning what we're going to do next and you can list okay that we're going to do this like three four five features in the next three months so that's planned i don't even know what those people do in between but now that stuff is going to be done in a week and then if you don't have like a vision or a longer plan then like you will cost with your pants down basically so it's really like uh, emphasizes long-term planning, like long backlogs and like product product visions and so on, because making code has become really, really, really fast. And in in my job, it's like easy to notice that I have much more time to think about how to develop company, I have time to think about sales and marketing and hiring people, developing how how things work. Because I don't need to parse any dates ever again. I don't need to write any like Python visualizations, many like config stuff, like things that I've done like tens and tens of thousands of times in my life. I don't want to do that again. And I hope that nobody else want, wants to do that either. So that's basically all I had to say. So not much technical stuff. But this is something that we're really driving in our company on a daily basis and we're like seeing the effects immediately so gpt4 came like two months ago and with with it, its help we've been able to do kind of projects that we have never would have been able to do, do in like such a short time span and resources that we have at the moment so i really think that this should be taken very seriously because i meet i meet people who talk a lot lot about this they they paste like LinkedIn news and so on. Then when you ask them, so how do you use it in your work? They often say, well, I didn't really try or like I tried it once and it didn't, didn't really work with my very special case of writing some SQL query or something. So, yeah. Any, any questions or comments? Thank you, Sergei. We have plenty of questions. Yeah, Harry is right. I think that's what. <laughs> I'll pass the mic. Antti is the mic. Yes, go ahead. No, oh, hello. Uh, so, would you estimate that the productivity improvement? You are four times faster, ten times faster. 
uh, it's kind of really to count if like the, it's if you are you are comparing to zero that it opens possibilities that you couldn't do before but if i would think about or maybe like from the experience of my friends they said it's about 30 percent that they can make their lead work more effective but in cases of entry-level developers it's really hard it's really hard to estimate yes you need to do some a b testing it's somebody like do this manually and this other guy can use gpt4 i forgot what i was about to ask but anecdotally it is pretty much that the juniors can take a really big impact on the productivity by chat gpt and just doing stuff for example, me, I'm a senior, I've never been a good coder, but now I can kind of lot up being a very good coder with chat GPT and nobody even notices that I, I never was a good coder. <clears throat> but it really is a change now to a lot of places and it really changes your expertise on a, like uh, when you're at a senior level, you're not talking about, I know all of the coding bells and whistles, that's not what you're doing. You're doing, as I said, the higher level strategic things and all of that and really communicating with people. And that's something that I think it's gonna, impact a lot of people at work because now your skill set of being the most senior SQL wizard is actually non-existent. You, you gain no competitive advantage about that skill. So I, so very important thing uh, or like an interesting question maybe, uh, now I remember what I was going to ask, is exactly this, that, that how, how do you think uh, senior position will change? Like these deep technical positions will change with chat GPT? Uh, yeah, I, I basically hope that we will start doing like more deep technical things because most of us don't really do technical things. Any AI project that we do, it's not, we're just like using an API, like nothing really. So that's like the main thing. And the other thing I hope that we can do things more, more effectively. We free up time to use our brains instead of using our fingers. Just there's lots of slack to take out from like IT sector, like many projects that I've done and many people have done. Never, nobody has ever used the results. So, what the hell are we doing? Yep. Yeah, I just have something like a very basic question. So, what will happen, for example, if you have like 10, 20 developers and they're using all their GPT and somehow if you have a request for a project from a customer that uh, we need something no open source libraries, nothing which is available. Some things we need very for security or whatever reason, something very uh, transparent and uh, something nobody knows about it. So is is the is is your developers, for example, or <clears throat> you and I use J J GPT. Yeah. So will I be able to do the coding because I'm used to the same tool actually, and it's going to give me something which is most probably public. Yeah, but the kind of project you describe with those like specs something that we wouldn't have been able to done without gpt for either but some very specialized things you have you have security of course you have the ai development for the people who are actually developing ai and you have something like domain specific special things like you need to know physics and stuff and so on in addition to coding i don't think like gpt is changing that those kind of positions and roles that much but i'm talking like average data science, average software development, which is like most of the projects anyway. And we need to keep that in mind. How about testing? How does uh, ChatGPT4 uh, affect that? We haven't done much testing with that yet, so. That's going to be next. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's not going to change. Kind of, it's or I say that now, and next year, some designer comes here and will, will say like it changes everything. But I mean, right now, of course, it's not changing those it's, it's actually emphasizing that kind of work and that's that's like the advantage if you have people who are actually care about users because many engineers they just think that users are stupid yeah 
actually now I want to take a sec you do that comment is uh, hi, I'm Henry I'm from the Europa framework board from two years ago and actually this is a very interesting topic that we that I was actually also going to bring up and that's why I was showing that the testing is actually really good with chat GPT uh, I now work with a company that makes self-driving cars I think we've generated like 80 percent of our test cases in the last two months with robot framework and judging so so actually lets us really easily define stuff in Gherkin and then based on those Gherkin syntaxes please generate me a library of the scenarios that fulfill this and this and this and done uh, and uh, it's so much cheaper than manual testing I never want to do manual testing of course I never want to do it with, with websites and all of that so so I think it's really going to eat manual testers for breakfast and manual testers anyway I, I think are a dying breed if I want to be a really really aggressive about this but I also had a question that uh, the question is when do the lawyers come up, come in and ruin this one for us as copyright? That's a that's a that's a good question. I know about that. And of course, the other thing, but at, at at this point, we feed it only the code that we have generated or it has generated. Never feed any code that we get from the customer if we don't have like explicit written permission to do that. And we have like guidelines, of course, for not feeding any credentials, any like you have some like important configs and stuff like that. So of course you need to keep that in mind. Yeah, but it's ruined anyway. I mean, it's not, <laughs> I mean. So what's the conclusion is this technology going to make us more stupid or smarter? Uh, that's a like weird question. Like, there's an implication that you think that coding makes us smart. I really hope it's not so. It will make us smarter by as bring, humanity. Bring, as humanity, I think I'm I'm an optimist. I think humanity is getting always smarter and kinder and nicer and caring more about each other. So I don't see a problem in that. That is a lovely statement. To conclude unless somebody wants to ask something else if not we thank you Sergei. <laughs> we have the pizzas ready Can you still anchor so my screen? Yes. The mandatory thank yous again. So thanks, Platform Six, and thank you, Tampere uh, AI ecosystem, for make, helping us with this meeting. Uh, the next one is going to be after. A summer break. So, if you have any ideas or if you want to get on stage, uh, you are welcome to let us know. And uh, now we want to reward all the active participants of the meetup. Heard at least those we give to Sergey and, and Harry. And we sent to Shreya. We have these for all you active people. Don't worry, we have we have extras as well. Please raise your hand if you want one of these. There, welcome. One for you. One for you. There you go. Yes, we have more. <laughs> you want one horse? Yeah, there's more. If, if the people online want to get their own beer, 
Very good, go. Where are you? Where are you, you? All right, there's still some more here. Um, yeah, uh, if you're into, into the AI topic, we, we've written also about this applied AI engineering and all the tools and how, how you can make use of them in your, your projects. Uh, we also have some uh, Softlandia LLM software in development. So if you're looking to leverage that technology, then get in touch. That's all I have to say. Thank you for joining. Although it's a sunny day outside. Ilmo, do you have any concluding words? Thank you.